right, good morning. morning everyone as more and more people uh, come on in we'll just we'll get started here in a minute how was everybody's second week of school Sounds great. <laughs> so far, so good. Good. You Are you a guitar well. player, though, Justin? What's that? You play guitar? No, that's my girlfriend's poster. Uh, she does, though. Okay. All right. I wish I knew how. Looks like a pretty comfortable chair there, Daniel. <laughs> I get this nice hospital bed here today. <laughs> quite a few good, quite a few good things here today, Ansley. Maybe my wife in a few minutes will bring over the baby, but yeah. <laughs> I think maybe this might be everyone that will get, maybe more people will show up, but I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first, I hope that the internet works well enough for our meeting today. Um, we're at a hospital, my wife gave birth uh, two days ago on Monday to our third child, a boy. Uh, so you'll, you'll probably hear and see Noah before long. Um, so I'm still in the hospital and the internet's not nearly as good. Um, and it, it thank you. Yeah. Yesterday we were, um, testing out the internet to see if I could even share my iPad screen with you so that I could draw on, on the screen for you. And we can't do that because the internet's not that good. So, um, what you'll, what you'll find is on Blackboard, I put up the empty the empty problems page and thank you Lily um, and I also put up the um, solutions to those problems um, and so those are both on blackboard and today what we'll do is we'll go through the solutions and I'm recording this so uh, if the video quality and the sound quality is not great because my internet upload is, is not great um, you will be able to see the the full quality video on YouTube, okay? Um, but if there's something that you can't understand when I'm saying it, or if my video lags, um, just throw a message in chat so that we can, you know, I can get it set again. Um, and, you know, today is a great day for somebody to keep track of the number of mistakes that I make. Uh, sleep deprivation has a profound effect on one's arithmetic skills. So <laughs> it's a, the number of negative signs that'll go missing today could be, could be astronomical. <laughs> uh, but my wife gets to hear this whole thing too. Um, so the, the, a good measure of how today is going will be, well, if she's asleep, <laughs> then I'll know I need to liven it up. Uh, uh, where is it on Blackboard? Okay, so if you go to um, I believe it's class recordings. Is that what I called that folder? So if I go to the class and I'm on course information, there's a class videos folder. 
and this is where I've been putting recordings of every problem that uh, has been requested. But uh, I put a folder at the bottom there, AMAT 100 class recording 9-2. I put the folder there because I was going to put these uh, problems as well as the video in this folder. So again, that's course content, class videos, the folder for 9-2-2020. Okay, before we get started with that recitation portion of the class, are there uh, questions about the class? Anything I can answer for you? Were there any problems with the homework or problems with the quiz? Yeah, I got a question. Yes. Are the Zoom meetings mandatory or? No, the Zoom meetings are not mandatory. Um, so the class meetings on, are on Wednesdays, office hours, Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, the office hours are even less mandatory. Uh, they're as needed. The class meetings are also as needed, um, but more recommended. I will put recordings of the class meetings on YouTube for everyone to see on their own time. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Also, congratulations on your kid. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. If, if anyone thinks of a question, um, you can put it in chat uh, or uh, you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me. Okay. Um, a lot more people are present. Okay. Did you say a lot of people are here? Yes, yeah, 14 today, that's that's a good number. I think the first Wednesday there was only 10 of us and that mm -hmm. included the algebra expert who's not actually a part of the class, so. So next class is gonna be in person? Next class for the time being is in person, good question. So next Wednesday, okay. eight to 9.20, uh, we, we're scheduled to be in person in lecture center 22. Um, and again, the, 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 that class meeting is not mandatory. Um, for those of you that are out of the country, I expect you won't even be there. <laughs> uh, for those of you that um, don't want to come, I will also record those meetings. Um, and you can watch a recording of those meetings uh, on your own time as well. I'll, I will be recording it through Zoom. So you could even join the Zoom meeting at that time. and. Uh, watch it live from wherever you're at. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, that reminds me, I I sent out sort of a, a poll in email. And I'm looking through the list of people who are, who are in here. I do see some names for people who have not responded. So um, if you have a strong preference one way or the other, uh, whether online or in person for these upcoming meetings, go ahead and shoot me an email just giving me your preference. That way we can, my advisor and I can make a more informed decision about how to proceed with class. Um, I sent an email out a while ago explaining the whole situation, but I obviously have a, we'll have a newborn at home and wanna take it a little bit safer. So, all right. You get to hear all of the strange noises that little babies make. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started and, and maybe I'll be able to cover some of those unsettling sounds up. <laughs> okay, so today we're doing problems from sections 1.3, 4, and 5. Again, this is what the homework is due on, or is due, uh, excuse me, this is what the homework is for this week. Uh, and it's again due Friday night. Um, We'll go ahead and start with section 1.3. Um, the first problem that I, I selected was a rather easy one. Um, it's just to find the sum, difference, or product. There's a lot of these problems. This one's number 16 from your textbook. Um, it, it really is, is not terribly difficult. Uh, the biggest problems with 
questions like this is just making sure you distribute whatever the sign is, whether it's a positive or a negative sign. Um, if it's positive, you, you need to make sure you do it as I did here. Uh, you need to make sure that the positive does not ruin any negative signs. If it's a negative, you need to make sure that you change the signs, okay? So this is just the distribution of the positive sign here. And then if I can go the other way here. Um, in problems like this, after that initial, you know, distribution that eliminates all of these parentheses, uh, you're just combining like terms. So the, the terms with X to the first and another term with X to the first, these can be combined into just, you know, we have negative three and then we have two more of them. So that's just negative one X. And then the, the constant terms, as you see here, those are combined as well. Okay, so this is a really common problem, adding two lines together, um, but also not terribly difficult. Questions on any of this? Okay, I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, the next one, very similar, but this time it involves actually distributing on both ends. So here we've got an eight times this first group 2x plus 5. So when you distribute that 8, it turns right away into a 16x, that's 8 times five, uh, 2x, and then an 8 times 5, which is 40. Then here, we do the same thing with this 7, but we have to remember it's actually a negative 7 that we're multiplying through, okay? So we're going to distribute that negative 7 to the positive x, which gives us a negative 7x. And then we're taking the 7 and distributing to the negative 9, which gives us a positive 63. And then it's, it's just combining like terms again. We've got 16x's and minus 7x's. So that's 16 minus 7 is 9. And then 40 plus 63 is 103. That's just combining like terms. This is just the more complicated version of what you saw in the previous problem. Questions on this one? All right. And now it gets even more complicated. Um, these problems, you know, we, we can really involve any sort of polynomial. Um, we can involve lines, we can involve parabolas, we can involve more lines, we can involve rational expressions, which we'll get to later. Um, but finding sums and differences in products really just boils down to two steps, as you've seen in these uh, last two problems. It's, it's first, distributing uh, multiplicative things. So we've got a multiplication here. We've got a multiplication here, technically, with this negative sign. That's an arrow. And then we've got a multiplication here. Um, with that five. So the first step is, is really quite simple. Usually it's just distribute. Um, and then the last step is almost always just combining like terms. Um, so here we've got a T squared and here we've got T squared. So we'll combine the, those two together. We've got two constants here and here. We combine those and then two linear terms here and here. Okay. Uh, finding sums, differences, and products, it, it's, it's a little more complicated than this in other problems, but it's really just these two general steps. Okay. Questions on this? Okay. All right. So the next big topic in section 1.3 is... Um, is this multiplication of algebraic expressions. So this means like uh, multiplying any polynomials together. Um, of course. Sorry for the pause there. Uh, welcome, my Mona. I'm sorry I did not see you were in the waiting room, so I hope you weren't in there too long. Um, we've just gone through three problems already, uh, and you can watch the recording later. 
um, to see those, but we're, we're here on problem 40 now. So, um, yeah, so in problems like these, multiplication problems, there's really just one method, okay? There's really just one method, and I'm gonna get to that here in the next problem. Um, but there are sort of tricks or uh, learning tools that you can use in order to do these multiplications. Um, one of them is called FOIL. And if you're in, if you were in America learning um, how to multiply binomials, so we've got, we've got two terms here in this and two terms here, um, those are binomials. In America, if you learn to multiply binomials together, you more than likely learn the FOIL method, which stands for first, outer, inner, last. So you can multiply the first two terms of each binomial together. That's 4y squared. You can multiply the outer two terms together. That's the red 2y times negative 5 is negative 10. Then you multiply the inner terms together. So here's the two inner ones. That's 5 and 2y to give you 10y. And then the last terms of each binomial. So 5 and 5 give you, well, 5 and negative 5 give you negative 25. And then just combining like terms gives you the final result. Um, as I said, in America, this is typically the way that students are taught to multiply binomials together. Um, another common method is squares. Um, so the way this works, uh, and this works for any any number of polynomials. Actually, this is a, a sort of a, just a an organizational method for multiplying any polynomials together, whether they're binomials or more. Um, what you do is you list the terms for one of the two factors. So each of these are factors here. You just list the terms of one of them vertically, as you see here, and you list the other terms horizontally. And then you just make like a big Punnett square below it. Um, I'm seeing my internet is unstable. How's the sound quality coming through? Is it still okay? It's fine. It's fine. Okay, good. Um, it may be just the video quality that's suffering more. But all right. So yeah, you just make this big Punnett square here. And you you'd multiply rows times columns all the way through. So 2y times 2y is 4y squared. 2y times negative 5 is negative 10y. You just you do this. The multiplication happens between the, the column and the row terms. And then you just add everything up inside here. OK? And that gives you the same result. This is more generic than FOIL. Um, they're sometimes called algebra tiles. Uh, or algebra squares, but it's it's another method of multiplying algebraic expressions. Um, I think it works very well. It's my preferred method over foiling, um, but I think really the the one method that you should know how to uh, know what to do with um, is what both of those are really based on, and that's just distribution. Um, the distributive property. So I'm going to show you that with this one. See, this one's a little more complicated. It's It's got half powers, um, but it's really just the same thing. I'm going to simplify this just a little bit by calling this first binomial, if you can call it that. Half powers aren't polynomials, but I'll call it a binomial for just, I'll abuse that word for a second. Um, I'm just going to call this A. Right, it's just a number, so let's call it a. So a times x to the one half minus y to the one half. If we just distributed that a, right, we just multiply it by the first and multiply it by the second, we would get this result. Okay, that's true. That's the distributive property of multiplication um, over a difference or sum. Next, what I'll do is I'll I'll put what a actually was in. So I'll I'll resubstitute in for what a was. Okay. 
and then I'll do the process again. So I'll distribute here now this x to the one half to the y to the one half, and I'll distribute it to x to the one half. You see that written below it, immediately below it. And then I'll do the same thing over here, keeping in mind that there's a negative sign in front. So this y to the one half is multiplied here, and it's multiplied here, and the negative sign is on both. Okay. So this gives us the final result before simplifying here on this second to last step that I've got a star on now. Um, and we can see some, some things that'll simplify. X to the one half times X to the one half. They've got the same base we, we saw last time when you've got exponentials with the same base, you can add the exponents. So this is X to the first. I'm not gonna worry about adding exponents here because these are the exact same terms, x to the one half, y to the one half. One's positive one, one's negative one, so these totally cancel. And then last term here, we've got the same base. And that means we add the powers and here we go, it's just x minus y. So this process just used the distributive property. It did not use any fancy you know, initialization FOIL. It did not use any fancy organizational techniques like algebraic squares or tiles. Um, it simply used the mathematical rule of the distributive property two times. You could have done it uh, in one fell swoop. You know, if you can keep track of everything and go from step one here, if I can write a one, you, can, you know, go from step one down to st uh, the star. If you can do that in one go, awesome, great, great job. Um, if not, then just, you know, work your way through as I did here. The reason I say that uh, this is probably the, the best method um, and probably algebra tiles is a very close second um, is because this method works for anything the sums and differences of anything multiplied by sums and differences of anything. Um, it, it doesn't just work for polynomials or for expressions like this with two terms. Um, it literally works with any multiplication of any sums or differences. Uh, you could have exponentials in here. You could have logarithms in here. You could have giant sums as long as, as you want. Um, the only thing you need to be careful about is uh, things you'll learn about in calculus, which are infinite sums. And so there's issues with things that have infinitely many terms, but only sometimes. Is it time to see baby? All right, baby's kind of up. If you want to see baby, no, here he is. Hopefully he doesn't throw up all over the computer. <laughs> All right, I don't know if you can still see him. My camera's on. <laughs> Some of you out there are like, it's a kid, so uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's my kid. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. He's so adorable. Noah Stephen Love. There's another student in this class uh, that has the exact same initials. I thought that was so coincidental. I like his knuckles. His knuckles? Okay, thank you. He's got big hands. <laughs> he does have big hands. Um, like, it, if you put your finger, he's going to give a good squeeze. Oh, yeah, he will. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> yep. It's my third kid, though, so this is... Whew. When I get home, <laughs> things are going to be crazy. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry, back to the screen here, back to the math. Less important things, I suppose. So, any questions on this a little bit more involved distribution problem? Um, I have a question. Dude, go for it. When I was, um, I, was just, I was doing some problems in the book yesterday, and yep. 
one of them you had to distribute a, uh, a square root. Yep. I don't know like how to do that. Okay. Let me scroll down to the bottom here. Uh, this is going to be difficult, perhaps. It was. Do you, do you remember what the problem was? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's uh, it's example five. In the it's two x minus the square root of y, and then, and then uh, um, something else. Two x, two x plus the square root of y. Okay, so it's two x minus square root y. I'll write the square root symbol here in just a second. And then 2x plus square root of y. Yeah. Okay. So I, I know this is really tiny for you to see, but again, I don't have my iPad with me today. <laughs> the, the internet was not working that well. So there's a square root here. Um, let me, so really you, you don't treat this any differently. Um, Let me delete that because it's okay. Maybe not. No. Bingo. Okay. Um, so two x minus square root y. I'm gonna have to write it this way, and then two x plus square root of y. Um, this really is, is not done any differently. Um, you can use the FOIL method still. You can use the distributive method. You can use the algebraic squares method. Um, I'm just going to do this uh, just sort of on, on the fly in my head here. So it, we're just taking 2x times 2x. From the FOIL method, that means it's the first ones from each of these sums or differences. Um, then we're gonna take the 2x times positive square root y. So that is plus 2x times square root of y. Okay, so I'm taking the first 2x times the square root y here. That's the outer from FOIL. And then I've got a minus square root y times 2x. So I'm gonna keep the negative sign here and the 2x times square root of y. And then, don't worry, don't, don't apologize, it's okay. Um, he'll settle down in just a minute. He's getting his diaper changed. And I don't know when the last time any of you have had your diapers changed, but it's not always a pleasant situation. <laughs> then the last thing is just the square root of y times the square root of negative y, the negative square root of y. Okay. Um, the one thing that changes here is that this square root of y times the square root of y becomes just y to the first power because it's y to the one half times y to the one half, right? So we add the powers because they are the same. Um, the two x times the two x becomes four x squared. Um, we could write this next one kind of like, Oh, yeah, that's right. They, the next two terms cancel, right? It's plus 2x root y minus 2x root y. Those cancel all together. And then we've got a minus. Yeah, there we go. So, so this method still works. FOIL method, multiply the first ones. Multiply the outer ones. Multiply the inner ones. Oh, boy. Oh boy, <laughs> trying to, I wish I had my, I wish the internet was good enough for my iPad right now. Then we're multiplying the inner ones, which is these two. And then we're multiplying the last ones, which is these two. Okay. Does that, does that help? Uh, yeah, just how would you multiply uh, 2x times the square root of y? Like what, what would that look like? Okay, okay, that's a good question. I think it gets at sort of sort of a fundamental thing here, uh, something that's really elusive to I think describe and and 
and uh, understand really. Yeah, so X is a variable, right? Um, and so is Y. But they're, they're, they're just placeholders for numbers. So we don't know what they are, right? We, um, we um, can try and move things out of the way here. We don't know what they are, they're, but they are just numbers. They could be different numbers. So when you're when you're thinking about you know what to do with them, what is the square root of y times two x? Um, the answer is you really can't do anything until you know what those numbers are. So if I told you take two, multiply it by x, and multiply it by the square root of y, you know you'd probably scratch your head and say, well, what's x, and what's y? Right, because to, to do that computation, you need to first take the square root of y, and you can't know what that is until you've been told what y is. Um, similarly, you can't multiply that by x because you don't know what it is. So, what how do you multiply 2x times square root y? You don't, you, you leave it written 2x square root of y um, until you know what those numbers are. Um, in this problem, you'll see that this term here, we have a plus 2x times the square root of y and we have a minus 2x square root of y. Those are the exact same with the exception of the sign. So in this case, actually you can cancel them out altogether. You can just say whatever that number is, we're also subtracting that same number so we can get rid of them all together, you know, resulting in our final answer, 4x squared minus y. Um, but if you didn't have cancellation, and if you don't know what x or y are, because they're unknowns, they're variables, then you just have to leave it like that. Um, you can't combine exponents because they have different bases. X is the base of X to the first and Y is the base of the square root of Y, Y to the one half. Um, so we don't have rules to, to do these combinations. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think I got it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, thank you for asking it. it and it's a, uh, it's definitely not an easy thing to, to get. Um, okay, are there other questions on this? Or similar problems, I suppose? How would you distribute uh, like a trinomial, two trinomials? Right, so you can you can you can use either method this is going to be very difficult for me here but i'm going to just draw the the squares okay um so with trinomials you would actually you could actually use this algebra tiles method um Okay, that did not work at all. <laughs> I don't know if you just heard that, but engineering is going to be testing the uh, fire alarm system. So I might, uh, I might lose some sound here in just a second. This is pretty ridiculous. Um, this is a fun time. You know, I'd never thought streaming from the hospital would be so eventful. Um, I don't exactly know what just happened. So let me pull up um, a, a Word document here. And I can show you what that would look like. But basically, 
you can, I'll explain it as I go here. Basically, you can just, um, um, use the algebra tiles or the squares method. And you can, instead of using, you know, a two by two square, if you're taking a trinomial times a binomial, you can use a three by two rectangle. And you'll just list the trinomials terms uh, all together on the top or along the, the, the side, whichever one you, you think to, to put where. Um, I will share this now and I'll just show you. Um, so if I want, scroll. So if you've got a trinomial, you can, as I said, divide it three ways vertically and then two ways horizontally. And you maybe just list the terms here. This would be like for 2x plus 3. times any old trinomial like uh, negative x squared if google draw will allow me to draw something okay google you're killing me man up here okay it doesn't like negative signs negative wow there we go that's a negative sign uh x squared 2x and one. Uh, you would just do the same thing. You would take 2x times negative x squared and put that result here. You take 2x times 2x, put that result here. 2x times one, put that result here. Three times negative x squared here. Three times 2x there, and then three times one there. And then you would just add everything up. Okay. Let me try and. This is, this is really ridiculous. Um, x squared plus 2x plus 1. OK. Um, I forgot the negative sign. And of course, it won't let me write that. So negative. Bingo. So that's really thrown together right there for you. but. This algebra tiles would work very well for that, um, or just the distributive method. So call this A, and then multiply it by negative x squared, and then A times 2x, and then A times 1, and then distribute again. OK? All right. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and move on to the next questions. We're gonna see this distribution, I think from time to time again. Um, and in the next problem, we'll actually see it in reverse order. So another kind of problem that you're, that you're given is to factor out common factors. To factor means, you know, to break something down into the, the the terms which multiply together to give you what you had before. So here we've got 2xy minus 6xy squared plus 3xy. And factoring out the common factor basically means to determine what two things, three things, four things can be multiplied together to give you that. Um, a nice way of doing that is to just list the factors of every term. So this, this is a term, 2xy, 2x squared y. This is a term, 6xy squared. This is a term, 3xy. So I've listed those here on the left. And on the right, I've listed out the factors. Okay, And in this way, we can sort of see what factors are shared between all of them. And those factors that are shared between them, those are called common factors. Um, 
and that's going to help us determine what things multiply together to give us that that full result. So two x squared y has got a two. It's got an x squared, so that's an x times an x. It's got a y. The negative six x y squared has got a six, which is a two times a three. It's got an x and a y times a y. That's the x y squared. And then there's a negative sign in front, so I've just listed that here at the end as a times negative one. Um, and then 3xy is the simplest of the bunch. It's just a 3 times an x times a y. Okay. Now, all of these have an x and a y factor in them. So they all have the common factor x times y. That means that each of these terms can have that factored out. So we can take x times y and multiply it by the same sum of things without those factors in there. So the first term was 2x squared y, but if we take out the one of the x's and one of the y's, all that's left is a 2x. The next term in the sum was actually a minus 6xy squared, but without an x and a y in that product, we just have a minus 6y. And then the 3xy, the last term, if we take out the x and y that were common, we're left with just a 3. So we've got this product now of xy times 2x minus 6y plus 3. This is the fully factored, um, the fully factored uh, expression. And it's, it's had removed the common factor. Um, notice, you know, there's, we're missing a two here. If this had a six on it or a, a, a 12 or something, we could have factored out a two along with it. Uh, notice this one on top doesn't have a three on it. If this had a six in front or if it had some, something with a factor of three in it, we could have factored out a three as well. Um, you can also factor out negative signs um, uh, if, if everything shares a negative sign. Okay. Questions on this problem? Are you still with me? Did I lose you? No, no questions. Okay, okay, good. Everyone was real quiet. I have no certainty in the internet here, so. Okay. So let me go ahead and try and move on here. Oh, I actually have uh, one question. Go for it. Um, so like when you like solve this, can this also be considering just factorizing the expression or? Yeah, yeah, okay. this, these um, instructions, factor out the common factor, <laughs> you, could, you could say literally what you just said, factorize the expression or, or factor the expression fully. Um, this, is, this is the answer you would get. Um, yeah. Okay, anything else? Try and get back to the, okay, here we go. Okay, so the next one um, gets at what you were just saying, factoring something. Um, so the instructions don't say, you know, factor out the common factor, they say just factor it. Um, and here's just two trinomials. So this is three terms, x squared plus four x minus five. Remember terms are always separated by addition and subtraction. So both of these are trinomials. They've got three terms in them. Um, factoring usually just means to write as a product of two linear equations, although that is not always the case. The linear thing is subjective. To factor, you could factor these things 
any number of ways, truly. Um, so, but for you in pre-calculus, factoring usually means to do this process that we have here. And this is the opposite, the, the reverse direction from foiling that we saw before. Um, here we're, we're looking for um, two things like this, which when you go through the foil process, result in this. Okay. There are tricks to this that I know you've seen in high school before. Um, but I think the, the general idea is you have this goal in front of you, which is at the very beginning, a set of empty parentheses. So your goal is you want something like this. And the, the strategy for these is to remember that whatever goes here first, and whatever goes here first, there's two spots, remember, there's, there's a first and a last spot in each of these separated by an addition or a, plus, a negative sign. Whatever goes first in both of them, those two things multiply to give you the x squared. Okay, the other strategy idea here is that whatever you put in the last spots, those two things must multiply to give you the negative five. So this idea of factoring comes up again. We'll factor x squared and we will factor negative five. And we're gonna just sort of play this game of how can we get a four x from the factors of x squared and the factors of negative five. Um, I think in just a second, we'll have someone come in here to discuss something with my wife. It might be about the baby. So I might have to pause this uh, or mute myself for a second, um, but it, it might be going into a different room as well. So we will see. Um, Okay, so I might also have to um, throw my mask on, but uh, I'll keep talking. Um, so where was I? So yes, the, what goes first here is, is factors of x squared. And this is an easy problem for this one because it's x times x, right? That's how you can get x squared. Um, you could also do weird things like 1 half x times 2x. That's totally valid. Um, but you, you want to try and stick with the simplest factorizations possible. Um, hello, come on in. Um, so, uh, so for this problem, it, it's quite simple, just that x times x, right? Um, the next part, we've got negative five. That's also very simple because it only has one factorization. It's one times five. Five is prime. So one times five is the only way we can do this. But we do have some, some leeway, some decisions to make about where the negative sign goes. And now here's the last piece of strategy to sort of determine where that negative sign goes is this. This positive four X, this four is going to be the result of combining like terms. So if you remember when you FOIL, you, you, you know, multiply the first ones, you multiply the last ones, and then you multiply the inners and the outers. And the sum of those inners and outers, those are combined, those are like terms always uh, in problems like these. Um, the coefficients will combine through addition and subtraction. So we've got a one and a five, one of them's negative, one of them's positive and we need them to combine into a positive four. So you can see I've already chosen here plus five and negative one. And the reason is when you add five and negative one, you get a positive four. OK. 
Okay. So just overarching here again, the first two things multiply to give us x squared. So I picked x and x. Easy. The things that go last need to multiply to give you this last constant term, negative 5. So I picked 1 and 5. And then those two things need to add together to give you the 4x, the middle term. And since this was a negative 5, I was able to select one of these two, 5 and 1, to be negative. So I picked a positive 5 and a negative 1. Okay. The next one really lets this strategy, you know, shine, but it also makes this strategy, it also highlights the difficulties in this strategy. This is not an easy problem type, uh, really, until you, until you get it quite well. Um, so 8x squared minus 14x minus 15. With this 8x, we've got options. We could do 1 times 8. So 1x times 8x. We could do 2 times 4. Uh, 2x times 4x. Um, we've got options there. And that makes this process more difficult because there's more combinations of things for you to try. Um, 15, we need to pick factors of 15. So we've got some more options here. We've got one times 15. We've also got three times five. And even what makes things even worse is that this is a negative 15. So one of these has to be a negative and one of these has to be a positive. So you can do the math. We can either pick 1 and 8 and pair it with 1 and 15, or we can pick 1 and 8 and pair it with 3 and 5, or we can pick 2 and 4 and do similar pairings. There's four possibilities here of choosing these pairs, and then there's negative signs. So now there are, what's that, make it eight possible pairings that you can use. So... A lot of this just rests on, because we know it has to be one of these pairs and one of these pairs for these numbers, but figuring out which one comes down to getting a negative 14x. So some mental arithmetic here helps. Um, when I was doing this yesterday, I was just noticing that we've got 20 and we've got 6. So we've got 2 times 3 and 5 times 4. Um, if you take 20 minus 6, you get 14. Or if you take 6 minus 20, you get negative 14. Um, so when I was doing this, I saw that. And, I, and so I said to myself, well, we've got our pairing. We're going to take the 2 and 4. And we're going to take a negative 5 and a positive 3. Because I know negative 20 right here and a positive six give us negative 14. So organizing them in these parentheses is the next difficulty but it's not that much of a not that big of a deal. We want the two to multiply by the three so we pair this 2x with or not with the three we don't pair it with the three because we want it to multiply in the negative five similarly is not paired with the 2x because we don't want to multiply it by the 2x. We want to multiply it by the 4x. So the general idea here is if two things are multiplied together, like this 5 and the 4x, you've got to put them in opposite parentheses. You can't put them in the same one. Um, this, this process of factoring the first term and factoring the constant term and then looking for that middle term combination uh, that is a skill that you can develop. <laughs> so um, just it just takes doing quite a few. Any questions on this one? No, no question. Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and move on. Um, so that's it for section 1.3. It was just a lot of multiplying, simplifying, uh, 
factoring out, things like this. Um, the next one was uh, section 1.4, and it dealt with, as you can see, finding domains. It, can, it dealt with rational expressions, uh, their ratios of polynomials, um, and adding together and subtracting polynomial or rational expressions. So first big question was domain, finding the domain <clears throat> of an expression. So domains, finding out the domain. It, the domain is really just a big sort of, sort of like outsider's perspective of a function or a, an expression. And I say that because when you see it, something like this, 4x squared minus 10x plus 3, you know, you as the outsider, you have no idea the purpose of this. You also have no idea uh, uh, what's allowed and what's not, right? Um, you see X is just some number that somebody gets to pick or find in some cases. Um, the domain is all of those numbers <clears throat> which you can actually compute this with. So what number? Could you compute the square of? Can you can you square any number? Yes, you just multiply by itself, right? Anyone can do that. Um, how about taking ten times a number? Can you do that with any number? Yes, of course you can, right? Now, what about adding or multiplying these things together? Yes, you can. You can take four times the square of any number you can add that 4x squared to 10x that's fine you can subtract it you can you can also add 3 to it the, there's no problems in the computations here no matter the number you pick i could give you an irrational number i could give you a rational number an integer it wouldn't matter there's no problems here so the domain is any number for this class any real number but the domain is truly any number works here. Okay. This problem is rather uninteresting because of that, but any real number works. Um, for problems like this, you just need to ask yourself this big question every time. Are there any values for the variable um, where I can't compute the expression? I, you know, like where you, you literally don't know what to do or there's something that's undefined. <clears throat> we see that here. So you see a, a rational expression. So we've got a polynomial divided by a polynomial. Um, and so we're just going to ask ourselves, could I compute everything this tells me to compute? So in the numerator, can I square any number? Yes. Can I add one? Yes. Okay, let's go to the denominator. Can I square a number? Yes. Can I subtract the same number from the square? Of course. And can I subtract two from that? Of course. There's no issues with computing the numerator. There's no issues with computing the denominator. The problem comes in this problem when we take this division. That's what this fraction is. This here is a division sign. So we need to stop here and, and think about this issue. Can we always divide by x squared minus x minus 2? Well, what if we're accidentally dividing by 0? Right? That, that's a big issue in mathematics, um, is division by 0. Um, and it stems from what division is. You know, division is taking something that is an amount, a whole thing, and breaking it into pieces of equal size and dividing them out, right? You, you break that equal amount up. If you're dividing something by two, you're breaking what you have into two equal parts. Uh, and you're giving that amount out, whatever it is. So when you're, when you're being asked to divide something uh, into zero things, what do you mean? Do you mean don't touch it? Right? Because that's what dividing by one means. When you take a, an amount and you divide it into one part, you get the original amount. 
So what does divide by zero mean? It doesn't mean breaking it up into one part. It means literally break it up into zero things. <laughs> that it doesn't even make sense. You can't break it up into zero things. So division by zero is this, you know, conceptually, uh, uh, you know, sort of impossible task to do. So we need to figure out where we are dividing or for what numbers we are dividing by zero. Um, and this in involves solving that denominator for its zeros or for its roots. Um, I did this one just without showing any work. Um, you could factor this and then solve for its uh, factors. You could use the quadratic formula um, and solve for its factors. But when x is 2, when x is negative 1, this denominator is 0. So that means those two numbers are not in our domain. So the domain is any real number except 2 or negative 1. Those are the two holes in the real numbers. So I've written here in interval notation from negative infinity to negative 1, but we've got a hole here. I'm not including negative 1. And then again, the union of that with negative 1 to 2. But again, I'm not including negative 1 and I'm not including 2. And I take again the union, so I'm putting that together with 2 to infinity. So I've got this huge number line and I've just poked out negative 1 and 2. That's the domain here. Okay. Um, is there another one with domains? No, so that's it for domains. Does that make sense? Do I need to discuss that more? I do remember a problem later where we need to consider, consider the domain, so we will touch on one more thing later. Um, for now, I, maybe I'll move on unless somebody speaks up. All right, so the next one, it goes right back to what we've done earlier. So I'll just, I'll go through this rather quickly. When you're asked to simplify a rational expression, you've got a polynomial divided by a polynomial. The task really is, is just really straightforward. You just try and factor both the numerator and the denominator. And this problem is really quite easy because these are both rather simple uh, factoring problems. Um, we see on top it's x minus four times x plus three, and on bottom we've got x plus two times x plus three. Okay, now that we've written these as uh, factors, we could remember that a product of two fractions, so a over b times c over d, just by the properties of multiplication of fractions, this is the same as one fraction, a times c over b times d. This property works in both directions. So I could rewrite what we've got up here as a product of two fractions. One of them is x plus three divided by x plus three, which means one of them is just one. So we can just cancel these out. And all we're left with is x minus 4 divided by x plus 2. That's all simplifying rational expressions really is in many problems. It's just factor them out and get rid of any common factors on both top and bottom. You have to factor to do this. You cannot do this um, across sums. You have to factor first. Okay. I'll go to the next one because I'm pretty sure there's another one of these. Simplify the rational expression. <laughs> so we did problems like this before with numbers, but notice we've got a compound fraction here. There's a fraction divided by a fraction. So what do we do? Well, we need to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. We saw this last time. Um, no one divides fractions by fractions. Everyone multiplies fractions. 
Uh, that's how you compute things like this. You, you literally look at what's in the denominator, and if it's a fraction, you just forego dividing altogether. You just take the reciprocal of that fraction, or if it's not a fraction, but it sums of fractions, you put it into one fraction with common denominators, and then you take the reciprocal that results and you multiply it by the numerator. So that's what I've done here. So I've got the numerator written here, and I've flipped the denominator, and we're multiplying. x cubed divided by x is just x squared. There's a common factor there. There's also, if you notice, the factorization of x squared plus 2x plus 1. That's x plus 1 times x plus 1. Notice it also has a common factor here with the first fraction. So we can cancel those out too. And that just leaves us with x squared times x plus 1, which is x cubed plus x squared. Okay, so this simplifying rational expressions, it, it doesn't say this, but what it means to do is to factor completely, eliminate as many common factors as you can, and write the rational expression as simply as possible. Um, yeah. This is quite simple. Take a number and cube it, take, a, take the same number and square it, and then add the result. That's, that's not very many steps on a calculator. Um, the original problem, that's quite a few steps. Cube a number, divide it by that number plus one. Okay, put that off to the side. Now take the number and divide it by the square of that number plus two times that number plus one. Okay, now take that number and use it as the division uh, from the previous number we found. That's a lot of steps, right? This is way simpler to do. That's why it's called simplifying. We're removing all of those unnecessary computations. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Next one. Um, this one deals with um, finding common denominators with variables. Um, we've done this before with numbers, so that's, that's a positive for us. Um, but here we see 5 divided by 2x minus 3, that's just a number, minus 3 divided by the square of 2x minus 3. That's just a different number. You know, in fact, it's just this number squared. So that, that's nice. Um, we can find a really quick common denominator here. Um, we could just multiply 2x minus 3 times the square of it, and that would give us a common denominator. But we can find the least common denominator as well, which is just 2x minus 3 squared. The left fraction has this 2x minus 3 already, so we just need to square it. And then it'll be the same as the other denominator. Um, that's the shortest, easiest path to, to take in this problem. Um, we achieve that in the problem by multiplying by this fraction here that I've got in red. So we take this 5 over 2x minus 3. We multiply it by this red fraction. That converts the denominator into the least common denominator here. And then we just distribute the 5, and we get this numerator. Okay. Then when we take the subtraction, there are two fractions with common denominators. So we just write the denominator as 1. You know, we've got that here. These two become just 1. We don't change them. Um, and in the numerator, we just add and subtract the numerators. So 10x minus 15 minus three. We could simplify that a little bit to this final result, but, but that's it. Com common denominators with algebraic or rational uh, expressions are a little more difficult, but it just boils down to factoring that denominator and then 
figuring out what you need to multiply certain denominators by, which factors are missing um, in order to get the same denominator across the board. Okay. I imagine this kind of problem is, is the kind of problem that we might have issues with. Um, they're not easy, but you know, keep practicing and send me emails if you've got questions on them. Right now, are there any questions? Okay, I'll go ahead and move on. <clears throat> I think this is the last problem from section four, and then we might have five minutes or so for, for this one. Um, rationalizing the denominator. This is, um, this is something that depends on a little, a little trick, a little pattern we saw earlier in this section, maybe not this section, the last section, multiplying out um, binomials, I believe. But anyway, rationalizing means to make something rational, right? So this square root three, that's irrational. We wanna make it a rational number. Square root y doesn't have to be irrational. For example, y could be four and then the square root of four is just two, so that's rational. Um, but oftentimes it will be irrational, square root of a prime number, for example. In order to rationalize this denominator, I think our goal really is to square both of those. You know, if we can somehow square the square root of three and the square root of y, well then we're golden because then we get three and we get y. Um, that's removed all radical signs. So there's still the case that y is irrational, in which case the rat the denominator is still irrational, but they don't the problem, the book doesn't really account for things like that happening. But we had this nice little trick from a few sections ago to square two numbers from a product. So this is called the um, difference of squares factoring formula. If you've got two binomials, a plus b, a minus b, and if you multiply them together, you get a squared minus b squared. That's the tool we're going to use because we want to get three squared and we want to get b, or uh, excuse me, we want to get square root of three squared and we want to square the square root of y. So let's just consider this that square root of three is our a and square root of y is our b and see that there's a, there's a plus sign here. So this is our a plus b. What we need is a minus b to be multiplied by it. So you can see here, we've got that form, a plus b times a minus b. Come on in. So my red fraction is just one. Come on in. That's okay. Okay. I'm in a meeting, so that's that's fine. You go on over. Okay, so she's gonna be talking to her for just a few minutes, but um, so you can see this fraction here is just one. Um, so we're not changing the value here, but what happens is we're using this this pattern. We're leveraging this pattern in order to square that denominator's individual terms. So you see here in this final result that uh, that's supposed to be an arrow. In this final result, the denominator has no roots in it, which is really nice. Um, so this pattern, this is really nice. Um, it's really, really nice to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, but it takes a little bit of memory, you know, good memory to remember that. Um, I'm sure that you'll have more questions on things like this. Um, remembering tools like this, that's, that's pretty much, that's an advanced technique. <laughs> so if you're there, if you're already remembering things like this to use, um, you're doing really good. You're doing really well. Uh, if not, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, we're a week and a half in. Uh, these tools are things that, you know, you, you put in your toolbox 
only after leaving them out in the garage and outside in the rain for several weeks, you know, as you're getting used to them. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll move on to the next problem. Uh, and we'll move on here to section 1.5. Um, so this section deals with solving types of expressions. Um, I, I wrote a note here. The book used square brackets here. I changed them to, you know, round parentheses. It's more common to see parentheses used than the square brackets. When they're both used as grouping symbols, they mean the same thing. Um, when they're used as interval symbols, they are not the same. We remember that from the first section, I hope. Um, but anyway, in this question number 10, you're just asked, is x equal 2 and is x equal 4, are these solutions to the equation that's given? All this boils down to is, thank you, bye-bye. Um, all this boils down to is computing the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation separately and seeing if they agree. Um, you could also solve it. So set them equal and solve it and see what you get. <laughs> um, but the, the, the naive way to go about this is just to check left-hand equation or left-hand uh, value and right-hand value and see if they agree. Um, if they agree, then that input is a solution. It solves the equality. If not, then it's not a solution. So we see in A, I've just plugged in two, and then I've carried out all of these things. So three minus two is one, two minus one is one, one minus one is zero. I'm doing this from the farthest in, the most nested grouping symbols out. Okay, and the right-hand side's a little simpler. Four times two is eight, six plus two is eight. So eight minus eight is nothing. It's the same number, zero is zero. So two is a solution, great. And if, in fact, if you look at this problem, you say that's a line, I found one solution, uh, that's probably all of them, well, then you're probably right. <laughs> Unless these are the exact same line, in which case you'll have any number being a solution. So part B is not uh, uh, repetitive necessarily. You might actually need to check if there are, uh, if both are solutions, because that's possible. If both sides are the same line. So we plug in four and on the left-hand side, you get negative two, I think, if I did that computation correctly. Um, and then on the right-hand side, plugging in four, we get six. And six is definitely not negative two. So four is not a solution. Oh, he's yes. Gone. Here's that. Here's that. Did I? For me also. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yeah. You froze. Okay. Frozen for a minute. All right. All right. Can you see the screen again? Mm hmm Okay. Good. Good. We've got. Maybe we'll just do this last one. Um, I'll just go over the, the general idea. Solving. Uh, the general idea for solving any kind of equation, no matter what it is, is to try and isolate or estimate. <laughs> um, this is true no matter what level of math you're in. You either are isolating variables to solve for, or you're estimating because you can't isolate them. <laughs> um, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of methods for estimating things um, that you can't solve outright. But then there are even things that are not computable. So there are even things that even if you're given an equation, there's no way in the world you'll ever compute them, uh, no matter what calculator you use, whether concrete or quantum, it doesn't matter. So for this class, the general idea is just isolate. We won't ever get into the estimate region of things. Um, in calculus, you will learn about estimation techniques, um, but not in pre-calculus. Um, so what, I mean, what do I mean by isolate? I mean, get every term with that variable onto one side. 
So here we've got a one half X minus eight. Let's move the eight over. We'll, we'll get all the constants to the right side. Um, and then we'll have just an X on the left. And that's it. Once you've done that, you've solved it, right? Because <laughs> once we know one half of X is nine, well then X must be 18 because half of 18 is nine. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of problem you've got. Here's the next one. We're just trying to get all the X's to one side, uh, whether that's by adding and subtracting fractions over or by multiplying the whole thing by X when X is not zero. Um, we're just trying to isolate X on one side. Um, so here's, here's another one where we did that, right? Um, the next problem, if I can have another couple minutes, is just a ton of equations that you're seeing probably in some of your other classes or have seen in other science classes or maybe even in your future professions as engineers. Um, the first one, 31, is just the ideal gas law. It's got four variables in there. Uh, the pressure, the volume, the number of moles, and the temperature of a, an ideal gas. And then R is just the gas constant R. Um, number 32 is Newton's law of universal gravitation. It's got uh, four variables, force of gravity, little m is a mass, big M is a mass, and R is the separation distance between their centers of gravity. Big G is just, just the gravitational constant. 33 is the perimeter of a rectangle, length, width. L and W. 34 is a resistance formula for parallel ohmic circuits. Um, so if you know two resistors are in parallel with each other, you can compute their overall resistance using this formula. Um, if they're in series, it's, it's just even easier. You just add them together. But all of these equations have tons of variables. And in your future careers, you might be solving for some random variable uh, in any one of these. So all you're doing is adding and subtracting terms to the other side. You're just dividing or multiplying by variables to the other side. Um, you're just trying to isolate that desirable variable. Um, right. So I, I have in here a couple more problems about solving. Uh, there, this one's rather straightforward. It's just factoring and then uh, setting the terms equal to zero the factors equal to zero. Now, that one's not so bad. This one is a little more involved. Uh, it involves something called the change of variables and you need to determine the domain of solutions. So I see here, I say here at the end, the solution is X equals three. And then there's another solution here. Um, this got cut off. This was negative five over two. Um, can see it here. That's negative five over two down there. And then equal to the square root of x plus one. But that's ridiculous because the square root can't be negative. So the domain of this problem limits our possible solutions. Um, so that was it. That's all I had prepped for today. And I took you five minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, if you have any questions, please shoot me an email. Um, it was good to see so many of you online this morning. I hope it wasn't too distracted at times with people coming in and out um, or weird hospital noises, but thanks for joining us. Um, I look forward to seeing you again soon, okay? Have a Thank good day. You. Okay. Well. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>